everybody, good morning. Thank you for joining us at South Point Live Worship Online. We're so glad that you're here. I'm Elise, I'm part of the team at South Point. And whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or for the very best experience, southpointforyou.com slash live. We're so glad you're here. We sure are. I'm Paula, also a team member here. And I just have a favor for you. Would you take a moment and just fill out the connect card that's gonna be popping up in the chat? It's quick, it's easy, but the most important thing is it has prayer requests on there. So you can put your prayer request on there. We would love to pray for you. Uh, and we would love to get you connected. So just take a moment to fill that out. We would greatly appreciate it. That is one of my favorite things about Church Online is yeah. that no matter where you are or where we are, we can still be together, united as one, and we can That's pray for you. Right. Just let us know how we can do it. You know, this week, Pastor Matt is back with week five of his series, Free to Be Me. It's been an incredible series. And if you've missed any of them, and after you hear today's message, if you say, I want to go back and see more, it's easy. Go to southpointforyou.com. Check out the other series. Next week, Betty Jones. We all know and love Ooh, Betty Jones. Love yep, from Landmark Church in Alexandria will be here with us. And then Pastor Matt will be back the week after that with a brand new series called Circles. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Circles. All right, friends. In just a few moments, we are going to join the live worship service. Uh, we're going to worship in song, and we're going to hear the message. We realize that worshiping at home is a little different than worshiping here in person, uh, but that doesn't mean it's any less worshipful. I love Psalms 138 that says, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. Can you imagine the God of the universe has those kinds of thoughts about you and I and so much love? And later in that same chapter, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of life everlasting. This time of worship is a perfect time to open your hands and surrender to God. It's a way to connect with Him as you sing or as you uh, meditate on the words. The God who sees you and knows you is reaching out to connect with you. Let's join the worship team now. Welcome to South Point Church. Why don't you stand to your feet and worship with us because there is so much to be thankful for this morning.
own ideas. Lord, we come to you picking up at your feet, Lord Jesus, your will and your way. Lord, I pray that you remind us that you are always there. You are always with us, guiding us, speaking to our spirits so that we won't fall or falter. Let us know that in every battle that we face, it is not the end for the war is already won. God, your holy water leaves us never thirsty. Your bread of life, your body broken, leaves us never hungry. Lord, we thank you for providing before we ever needed it. We thank you for being omnipresent, for you are in the future and you already know what we need. God, open up our hearts this morning to receive the word of God that you have given to Pastor Matt. Thank you, Lord, for him being a servant on our behalf, God, for us to partake what you have for us this morning. Bless him and let him reduce his flesh, Lord, so that your spirit may prevail through him to speak life into our families and to the world that is hurting. God, for you never left us and you will never leave us. For you loved us first, God, and for this we love you back. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. So did you notice the recurring theme in the worship songs this morning was about freedom? And this is week five of Pastor Matt's messages series about free to be me. And I was scrolling on social media this week and I saw a meme about freedom. And it talks a lot about the difference between religiosity and freedom in Christ. And it goes something like this. I messed up. <sighs> My dad's going to kill me. Versus a relationship. I messed up and I need to call my dad. I want that to resonate in your hearts this week as you hear Pastor Matt's message today. Let that ring freedom. Hi, everybody. I'm Elise. I'm part of the team at South Point Church, and we're so glad that you're here. And if today is your first Sunday at South Point Church, wow, we're really glad that you're here. And we'd like to invite you to pull out your cell phone. Ha, huh, that's new, huh? Pull out your cell phone if you're new to South Point Church today and text the word welcome to the number that's going to be on the screen in just a moment. And if you do that, we have a special gift to say. We're so glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll come back. A couple of announcements I want to uh, let you know about. First of all, did you enjoy worship this morning? Yeah, me too. Worship speaks to my heart. Guess what? South Point Church is putting on our first night of worship in our brand new building. It's coming up Friday, October 21st at 7 p.m. There's no fee. There is going to be child care, so we'd like to invite you to come out. Bring your kiddos. Join us online. But if you can come in person, come be with us in person. Friday, October 21st at 7 p.m. You know, at South Point Church, we have a number of core values, and one of our values is that everybody has a next step. So we'd like to invite you today that if you're ready to take the next step in your relationship with God, we have a three-part series that you can jump in anytime. It's called our growth track. And today is week two. So don't worry if you missed week one. Just join us in the conference room for week two of growth track this morning. Then the last thing that I want to mention is that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And today particularly is Pastor Appreciation Day. I'm not asking you to tackle your pastors in the hallway and hug them. Some of them might like it. Some of them really won't. <laughs> I'm not asking you to whip out your wallet. What I am asking you to do for Pastor Appreciation Day and Pastor Appreciation Month is to commit for the rest of the days this month, to pray for your pastors. At South Point Church, we have a number of pastors who lead everything from our family church to, of course, Pastor Matt in here, to our executive pastor who leads all the tech things. We have Pastor Paula. So we have Paula, Tim, Kyle, Tracy, Matt. Did I miss anybody? Hmm? Matt? Oh, I would never miss Pastor Matt, ever. <laughs> Jen Curtis, yes, thank you. I went down the list of my, no, I was missing one. So please pray for your pastors. Commit, if you would, for the rest of this month. And then the last thing today, we'd like to thank those of you who give regularly and faithfully. If you give in person, please know that your giving financially makes a difference in our community locally, nationally, and globally. Super easy to give at South Point. We don't pass a basket during service. There's many ways that you can give. You can give in person at the kiosk outside. You can go online and set up your giving regularly, southpointforyou.com slash give. You can go to the South Point app, which by the way, if you haven't downloaded, I do encourage you to do that. It's a great thing to download. And of course, the last thing you can do is you can text to give the number that's on the screen. Thank you again for giving. It is another form of worship. Pastor Matt's getting ready to come up with a great message. May God bless you and have a great Sunday.
Well, welcome and good morning to South Point Church. Is anyone excited to be here this Sunday morning? That's why I love the first service. You guys rock. We want to say hi to those of you watching online, wherever you might be watching from. We want to say welcome to those of you here in the room. We're glad that you showed up this morning. Hey, we also want to say hi to our first-time guests. If this is your first time showing up, we just want to say welcome. We know it's always a risk to show up to new church, whether it's in person or online. We're so glad that you came. We hope to see you again next Sunday. If you don't know who I am, by the way, my name is Matt. I'm part of the team. Please just call me Matt, not Pastor Matt. I'm just a regular guy like every Everyone else. I always tell people, just don't call me late for dinner. That's what I would really appreciate. Hey, we're just going to dive right in today, and we're going to talk about something that applies to every single one of us. It doesn't matter kind of what your status in life is. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old, rich or poor, married, right, or you got kids, you don't have kids. What we're going to talk about today applies to all of us. It really doesn't even matter where you're at spiritually, whether you have a little bit of faith, whether you're just kind of checking out this whole thing, or maybe you grew up with something different, or, or maybe you've been going to church your whole life. It really doesn't matter. We're going to talk about something that literally applies lives to each and every single one of us, regardless of our status or regardless of our spirituality. Now, I want to share this idea, this thing that we all struggle with, with something that really just happened to me uh, a while back. I was together with my family and we were all hanging out. And, and, and when you get together with your family, have you ever like shared stories when you, when you get older and you're hanging out with your family and you share stories? And so I was with my four sisters, right? And, and we were all hanging out and we were talking. And, and my youngest sister, we call her the golden child. Anybody have a, like a younger sister? that they just got to be the golden child. Like they got to do all the things you never got to do, right? And so we call her the golden child, right? And so she was telling of a story of like we had all moved out. She was the last one at home, right? And she was in high school and she said, yeah, my dad went out of town and I had a, a key to the house and I thought it would be a great idea to throw a party for me and all my friends while my dad was out of town. And we all just kind of looked at her and said, yeah, sounds like the golden child. Sounds like something you would do, right? And she goes, yeah, like I just thought it would be great. So I, and she said, I didn't invite a lot of people. You know, I, I was, she was going to high school, right? And so she said, I invited just my close friends. You know, I just want to have a small little get together. And, you know, we thought there might be a little bit of alcohol there. But she goes, I didn't think it would get, you know, crazy or off the chain or anything. And so, you know, she's in high school and, you know, she's just kind of doing her deal. And she throws this party. And so she cleans the house. She's all excited. They have a little bit of food and people start showing up. And, and all of a sudden she realized that there are people there that she doesn't know. Because if you're in high school and you say you're going to throw a party and you tell your friends you're throwing a party, they tell someone and they tell someone and they tell someone. And all of a sudden, their, their, their whole street was lined with cars, right? And there were people in the house that she didn't know. And all of a sudden, she wasn't having fun, right? She was trying to keep people out of the bedrooms. I mean, we do big people church and little people church. So that's why I always tell you, encourage you. Pastors, man, the children's ministry is awesome. We don't do second class. We do world class right back there, right? So anyway, she was trying to keep people out of the bedroom. People were breaking into the liquor closet, my dad's liquor closet. Like it was crazy. And and people were drinking. It was crazy. The neighbors called the cops, right? People were getting sick because they drank too much and they were were puking. Like it was all the things like you just, like if you saw a movie, it was just like, it was just horrible. And so the next day she, all of her friends left. You notice that when it's cleanup time, yeah, yeah, kids included, right? If you're a parent here, you're like, yeah, cleanup time. No, everyone disappears, right? All of a sudden, your kids got homework. So everyone disappeared. And there she is, right? The police have been called. The neighbors know what happened, right? The liquor cabinet's been broken into, right? There's puke. There's just, she's trying to clean up this massive mess all by herself. And she goes, man, what a bad idea, She goes, I pictured this great thing happening. She goes, I envisioned this party with my good friends and I would be cool and it would be great and we'd hang out. And it turned into something different and it was miserable. I should have just listened to my, just shouldn't have done it. And you know what? What's true of her is true of us. Because it would be so easy this morning, right? It'd be so easy of us this morning to make fun of my sister and go, man, she should have known better. But I want to ask the question, how many of us in this room thought we knew, felt, and could see, and had the power to control something, and it turned sour, and it didn't work out the way we thought? And all of us have it. It's called regret. And that experience and your experience and my experience leads us to a truth this morning that applies to all of us. And I'm going to put it up on the screen right here. History, your history, my history, world history proves that we are 
that we are imperfect as anyone else at being our own authority, right? Remember last week we talked about the reason that authority is a, a curse word in our culture is because people have misused authority and so we mistrust and then mistrust leads to mutiny, but mutiny actually leads to the very mayhem that we're trying to avoid, right? And so we think, well, we need to be our authority, but where is imperfect? Someone should smile and say Amen. Right? We are as imperfect as anyone else at being our own authority because we all experience regret. We've all done something that we thought was good, we thought was right, we thought it would be okay, and it turned out miserable. And you might be asking, well, what does that have to do with me? Why, why are we even talking about that? Well, because we're all struggling with the same thing that my sister did, right? Right? She had a version of what a good life would be. Her dad had a version of what a good life would be. And they drastically looked different. And here's what I discovered. No matter where you're at spiritually and no matter what your status is in life, this is true of every single one of us. If we can go to the next slide. And it's this right here. All of us. All of us come under submission You know all the word submit means is there's a mission that we come under that we think is value. All of us come under the submission to some version of a, all of us are giving our lives to something that we think is a version of a good life. And the real question is, is it a version of a good life that we have or is it a version of a good life that our heavenly father has for us because I believe they have drastically different results. And as I began, oh, we might want to silence our cell phones. That was pretty cool, right? All of us come under submission to some version of a good life, right? And what I've discovered about a good life is that all of us, really, when it comes to a version of a good life, really, this all, at least for me, maybe, maybe not for you, but what I discovered is my version of good life really falls into two buckets. And here's the two buckets that my version of a good life falls into. Either it's a transcendent, right? Either we are created for something greater than ourselves, or self And you know what self-preservation is? Self-preservation is, is I want to feel good and I want to avoid pain. See, there's, there's two sides to self-preservation, right? It's one is I want to feel good and I want to enjoy life. And the second is I want to avoid anything that is uncomfortable. I want to avoid anything that is inconvenient. And I definitely want to avoid pain. And here's what I discovered. Maybe it's not true of you, me, but it's true of me every single day. That every single day I struggle with which one of these am I going to live out? Which one of these things am I going to submit? What is going to be the mission of my life today? Is the mission of my life going to be a transcendent purpose that means that we are created for more than ourselves? That we're created to not just consume our way to fulfillment or avoid our way to fulfillment? That we need more than consumption? And that we were built for relationship. Am I going to choose that? Or am I going to choose the way of feeling good or avoiding pain? And here's a question I just want to ask you. And I bet you already know the answer, whether you're online or in the room. Can any of us really consume our way to fulfillment? Because pleasure always needs a refill. You eat a meal, you get hungry. You watch a good movie, you want to see part two. You have a great time with your friends or your family. Well, it's not the last time you want to do it. If you have sex and it's pleasurable, it's not the last time you want to do it. The reality is, is you know this and I know this. Pleasure always needs a refill. None of us can consume our way to fulfillment. And the reality is, is that none of us can avoid our way into fulfillment. Avoiding inconvenience and avoiding uncomfortableness and avoiding pain isn't the way to experience fulfillment either. And I guess, and here would be my bet, if my daily struggle, is this your daily struggle? Do I have a purpose that is bigger than myself or am I living for self-preservation? Which version of a good life are we living? And here... Is why it's so important. Here's why we need to talk about today. Here's why I'm glad you showed up online and in the room, and it's this. Surrendering to a mission, because listen, here's the truth. All of us surrender to something. It's just what we surrender to. We all surrender to something. Surrendering to a mission that leaves us You know, my sister had this idea that this party would be awesome, and she did it, and it didn't give the results that she thought it would. Surrendering ourselves to a mission that leaves us empty in this world and in the next is something that no one 
wants that. Everyone wants to avoid it. No one wants to be empty in this life, and no one wants to be empty in the next. And if we're an imperfect authority as anyone else, should we be really making that choice? Because it's one thing to have and submit your life to a mission like a party like my sister and get it wrong once. It's a whole different story to have a version of a good life at the end of your days that leaves you empty in this world and the next. No one here and no one online wants that. And so this is what we're going to talk about. How do we... How do we make sure, how do we make sure that we pick the right version of a good life so that we don't end up empty in this world and in the next? And we're going to come back to that in a moment. Hey, we're actually in the fifth week of a series called Free to Be Me. We, we've done weeks one, two, and three, and four. And really, there's just been this really whole big idea behind the whole series. Matter of fact, this is kind of an ancient myth that's kind of be, been kind of repurposed, right? And it's like, hey, listen, your life will be great. If you, if you were just free to be you, if you could just do whatever you want, life would be great. And if I could just do whatever I wanted to do, life would be great. And what we've said and what we've admitted every week is this truth right here, right? It's, it's this. Free to be me sounds good in theory, right? Like, that sounds good, right? But reality reveals it has terrible consequences. And listen, I just want to say, this isn't Bible speak or pastor talk. This is something that, that you've experienced. Like, you, you didn't need to come to church. You don't need to redo. Like, you've experienced this. You know how I know you've experienced this? And it's the next slide. We've said it every week, right? And it's this true. The greatest, the greatest hurts received and given because someone was free to be me. The greatest hurt that you received is you had a line that someone shouldn't have crossed, and they were free to be me, and they crossed that line and hurt you. And the greatest hurt that you've given is that someone had a line, and you were free to be you, and you crossed that line. So free to be me sounds good in theory, but the experience that we have is, is that when the world is full of different lines, it leads to chaos, and it leads to conflict, and it leads to pain and damage. You've experienced it. Just watch the news. Just look at history. Free to be mean sounds good in theory, but its consequences are terrible. And so don't worry if today is your first Sunday in the part of the series. This one's going to make sense all by itself, so you don't have to worry about it, right? But if you want to catch up on week one, two, or three, or four, you can go on to our website, or you can go to our YouTube channel, subscribe. It drops at the end of every week, and you can catch up. But I want to go back to an important question. If we're... By the way, I'm as imperfect as anyone else. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I'm perfect. I need Jesus every day just like everyone else. If we're imperfect at being our own authority, is it wise? Right? If we can get it wrong. Remember week one we said we're limited in what we know, we're limited in what we see, we're limited in what we feel, and we're limited in our power. Really, as imperfect people, should we really be our own authority? We get that other people mess it up, but is it possible that we mess it up too? Is it wise for us to choose our version of a good life? If we can't see and we don't know and we can't feel and we don't have the power, is it really the wisest choice to bet our life and our eternity on our imperfection? And this is where every week I just get so fired up. This is where I go, listen, this is why I'm an all-in follower of Jesus. This, now, when I say an all-in follower of Jesus, I just want you to know I didn't, it's not like joining a church. It's not joining a political party. It's not joining a country. When I say Jesus, I'm talking about having a personal relationship with Jesus and followers follow Jesus. And this is why I'm a follower of Jesus, because what I love about Jesus is that God knew that you and I would struggle with this. Listen, God knew way beforehand that misuse would lead to mistrust, and mistrust would lead to mutiny, and that mutiny would lead to mayhem. But God knew that not only would we mistrust, that we would mistake self-preservation, pleasure, and pain avoidance as a version of good life. Matter of fact, this was so important that Jesus himself tells us how to avoid this. And not only does he tell us, he shows us. Matter of fact, I just want to share the words of Jesus. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's in the eye, but it's kind of the gospel of John. John says, for I've come down from heaven not to do. Jesus came and he says, I haven't come to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Now, here's something that's a little bit mind-blowing. Like, I don't understand this all. I don't understand how 
Jesus is fully God and fully human. But if God is really God, then I can't understand him anyway because I'm not him. Somebody say amen. Amen. Right? Jesus was fully God. Jesus was fully human. And because he was fully human, Jesus shows us what God is actually like because he's fully God. But Jesus also shows us what it's looked like to look like a true human being. And a true human being who's fully human then needs to not pick their version of the good life. Jesus picked the version of a good life that his heavenly father. He said, not my will, but I came to do the will of the one who sent me. And I wonder if humanity's problems are because we've picked a version of what a good life is versus God's version of what a good life is. And you might not believe that, but I believe I have history on my side that proves that humanity is busted and broken. And Jesus says, for I've come down from heaven to not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he's given me, but raise them up on the last day. Jesus came for a purpose. Jesus came for a purpose that outweighed self-preservation. Someone should say amen. Amen. And I just want to humbly submit that maybe why the world thinks that we are hypocrites is because the church is more worried about its self-preservation than its purpose to bring up there down here. Oh, that's not popular, is it? But Jesus came to do purpose. His purpose was to make sure that he brought you and I and everyone, and that everyone is made in the image of God. They're meant to be sons or daughters of the Most High. He says, my purpose is that I should do the Lord. I came for a purpose that outweighs self-preservation, and for that I am eternally grateful. But then there's something mind-blowing. Not only did Jesus come and say, I didn't come to do my will. I came to do my Heavenly Father's version of a good life, and he's given me purpose. We could look at that and go, well, I don't want that. Like, how do I know God's good? Jesus doesn't stop because Jesus wants you. Jesus wants me to know. Jesus is reminding himself of this when he says this. Here's what he says. For my father's will. So I just want want to make sure you, the creator of the universe says, my father's will is that everyone. You know who everyone is? Everyone. Whoever them is for you, they're included in everyone. The Father's will is that everyone who looks at the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. Now I just want to stop because here at South Point, we want to make sure you understand what eternal life is. Eternal life is not a length of living. Eternal life is the kind of life worth living forever. Eternal life is the kind of life that you live that death cannot defeat. That's why the tomb of Jesus is empty. And that's the kind of life that Jesus offers you and I. The Father's will isn't that you suffer. The Father's will isn't that life is busted and broken. The Father's will is that you would experience the kind of life that death cannot defeat. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. That is the Father's will for you. But for many of us, we believe the Father just wants to squelch fun. Now here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus didn't just talk a good game. Jesus didn't just tell us, oh, I came to do my father's will, and then he got a pass from all the pain, and life was peachy keen for him. Matter of fact, we see in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus tells his followers that he is sorrowful to the point of death. He knows what's before him, the cross and the abandonment. And the only time that he'll be separated from his Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit is when he's paying our penalty on the cross. And he can't even bear to think about what that's going to be like. He says, my soul is sorrowful to death. And we pick it up in Mark, and, and here's what's happening. It says, he went a little bit farther, and he fell to the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible that this awful hour awaiting him might never come. He realized what's before him, his purpose to fulfill it. And he realizes that his purpose means that he doesn't get to avoid all the inconvenience. He doesn't get to avoid all the uncomfortableness. And he definitely doesn't get to avoid pain. I love the truth that Jesus would say, in this world, you will have trouble. If you think following Jesus is a pass from trouble, you are listening to the wrong gospel. So he's saying, God, listen, I'm praying. I don't want to do this. This is uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good. It's inconvenient, and it's going to include some pain. I would love to avoid this. But then listen to his prayer. He goes on to say this. Father, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take away this come from me, yet I want your will. 
I knew this would be really popular. I knew people would be just like fired up, right? I want your will, not mine. Now, I just want to stop here because, like, if you're here and, like, you're just exploring faith, you're not a follower of Jesus, this is the time where you just get to eat popcorn and, and laugh at the rest of us, right? But I, I just want to say something really clear. Like, if you are a follower of Jesus, we have a little saying here at South Point. It goes, followers. Okay, can we try that one more time and act like you're really excited about that, right? Followers. Follow. Right? Followers follow, right? And so anyway, Jesus said, I don't want my will. I want and so if we are followers, then we go, I don't want my will, I want yours. And Jesus tells them as they come to arrest him and as they nail him, he says, I could call 12 legions of angels. And he yelled out, Father, forgive them. And he did his father's will. And they buried him in a tomb. But he didn't stay dead because there's a kind of life worth living forever that death and hell cannot conquer. A matter of fact, there was this guy. He's a disciple of Jesus, but he wasn't an original disciple of Jesus. His name was Saul. He actually used to kill Christians. And he didn't become a Christ follower, matter of fact, until he encountered a risen Jesus and his name was changed to Paul. Matter of fact, he writes a large portion of the New Testament. And matter of fact, he writes this letter to a church in Philippi. And this church is made up a lot of people like you and I. There's young, there's old, there's rich and poor, there's different races. There's people who had no church background, people who come from pagan church bound, people who are Jewish and grown up in church. And he writes them this letter. And he tells us about how Jesus did the will of his father, not his. And, he, and here's what he writes, and he's, and he's writing this to you and I. And he says, listen, your attitude should be that as the one Christ Jesus had. Your attitude should have as the one that Christ Jesus had, who being in the very nature of God, not consider equality with God, is something to use to his own advantage. Jesus didn't take advantage of his freedom. He humbled himself by being obedient to the death, even death on a cross. Now, here's the thing, if we're, if we're just really honest, there's a little bit of mistrust of God because we go, if I'm going to experience inconvenience and I'm going to experience what is uncomfortable and if I'm going to experience pain, is that really good? And as I was reading through this, I just had this just thing, like, here's what God teaches us. Like, it's so easy. L look at this. Jesus, Jesus surrendered to God's mission and lived the... Jesus lived the greatest life to ever happen in all of human history. Matter of fact, Jesus is in every part of the world. Jesus' life is still transforming people 2,000 years later. He never wrote a book, created an invention, led an army, held a political office. He just loved God and loved his neighbors, and his tomb is empty. You want to talk about a great life? See, we are worried that if we are inconvenienced and uncomfortable or have some pain, that somehow we won't live a version of a good life. Yet Jesus surrendered, and he lived the greatest life ever. Is it possible? Is it possible that a good life is not based on your pleasure or your pain avoidance? What if a good or the greatest version of our life is based on do we pick God's mission over our mission? And here's what I discovered is that Jesus reveals that what is temporary does not define a good life. If we're honest with ourselves, what we often define as a good life is temporary. Did I have a good day? Well, what does a good day mean? I got some Chick-fil-A and some crumble cookie. <laughs> I didn't get in an argument with my spouse. They gave me a raise. I got to buy something. I got to avoid pain. My body worked. And what Jesus is telling us is that you and I often define a good life as something temporary. Either we got pleasure or we avoided pain. And what Jesus is saying, is it possible that a great or a good version of life isn't based on what is temporary, but what is on transcendent, and that is your purpose? And so as we leave here, what is that practically? How do we actually do this? Like, how do we actually pick God's version how do we submit or pick his mission and come under that mission? Because that's all submission means. So we pick a mission worthy of our lives, something greater than ourselves, right? Well, how do we do that every day? Because every day the reality is, is that we are always pulled bes bes between this transcendent purpose and, and these things where we're going, hey, listen, self-preservation. I don't want to be in pain. I want to have pleasure. I want life to work. We're always pulled. 
And Jesus teaches us three things that we have to do every day. These three things we're going to have to wrestle with. And if every day we wrestle with these three things as we surrender to Jesus, I believe you will experience the good life, the version of life that God has for you. And we're going to put them on the screen. They're they're really not complicated. They're they're really just easy. The first one is, is choose and trust God's character, not circumstances. See, because we often believe circumstances reveal how much God loves us. And I'm just here to tell you the gospel isn't that your circumstances define how much God loves you. It's the cross. It is the cross of Christ that defines how much you are loved, not your circumstances. The cross and the empty tomb mean your circumstances will not define you, but what Jesus did will define you. And what Jesus did is he chose to trust his father's character, not his circumstances. Even though he was born in a manger, even though he was born into his own country that had been conquered, even though he was born into a family where they made fun of him because they said that his mom had cheated and, and that his dad wasn't the real father and his dad eventually died and he wasn't around when he was older and then his disciples would eventually leave him and the religious leaders denied him and the Romans would, would kill him unjustly. Jesus didn't have the greatest circumstances but he trusted in the character of God, realizing that circumstances don't define us. God defines us. Somebody should say amen. Amen. See, here's what I've discovered. When I was was a little kid, I I had a pretty tough life. I mean, I was molested. I was physically abused. My mom committed suicide when I was nine. I mean, I just had a, I mean, I could tell you stories of just bustedness and brokenness. And when I was growing up, I thought, well, God must hate me. God must not love people like me. I must be broke. Something's wrong. God must not love me. And then here, here's, what I, here's what I discovered. As those things weren't God's beatdown in my life, those were the brokenness of human beings who were free to be me. You see, our circumstances that are busted and broken are often not a result of God being beating us down because God for so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have life and eternal life. What I've discovered is that most of our bustedness and brokenness is not because God is angry and wants to hurt us. It's because God gave us freedom and we choose to do wrong. And that your circumstances are more a result of the brokenness of humanity, not God's beatdown. And what I love about Jesus is he chose to trust the character of his father, not the circumstances surrounding him. And I just want you to know, every day we're going to have to make that choice of which mission we're going to submit to. As we choose transcendent purpose or self-preservation, we're going to have to decide, am I going to trust the character of God or am I going to go by the circumstances that surround me? And Jesus chose to trust the character of God. That no matter what happens on this side, the tomb being empty reveals that God will wipe away every tear and he will make all things right. And every day we're going to have to pick that. Do we trust God's character or our circumstances? Do we trust our imperfect authority or do we trust the one who died for us? At South Point we have a saying, anyone who would die for you is for you. So we have to pick character, not circumstances. The transcendent over temporary Jesus realized two things, that pleasure was temporary because it always needs a refill. And he also understood that pain is also temporary. When we're in the middle of the shadow, we forget that there's this high beauty, as Tolkien says, that the shadow cannot touch. That there's this reality that pleasure is temporary, but pain is temporary. Pain doesn't last forever. And that when we make a decision to live our lives based on something that's temporary, we as eternal beings actually miss the mark of what we are created for. And Jesus said, listen, I've come to do something, to have a transcendent purpose. And here's what Jesus tells us. You should bring up there, down here. Jesus says, followers, follow. If you believe the world is busted and broken, you want to know, here's the the craziest part of Christianity. The craziest part of Christianity is not that God would take on human flesh and die for our sins. You know the craziest part of the gospel is that God would use busted and broken people to bring up there, down here on this planet. And at some point, we're either going to choose a transcendent purpose over the temporary pleasures and pain. True story. 
my, my adopted family that I've been adopted in to my, my family. They, they love me, right? And every couple of years, probably about every four or five years, our family gets together for like a giant vacation. My dad is very generous. Um, we've gone to beach houses. We've gone to Disney. We've done a bunch of different things, and it's just great. We all get to be together. Well, one year, my dad did this Disney trip. We all went to Disney. But you have to understand, I, I got four sisters, and so I got one sister who was dating. I had another sister who had two kids, a boy and a girl, and, and they were at a certain age. And then my other sister, she was married, and, and she had two kids, but they were really little, and they're on the spectrum. And then I had another sister, and she had an older kid, and she was a single mom. Then there was me, and I had two daughters who were, who were teenagers, right? And so when you go to Disney, man, they give you pleasure, and they help you avoid pain. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Disney's like heaven, except you have to pay for it. You see, in heaven, Jesus paid for it. And so we were there, and we had, a, like, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, we had a great time at Disney. Like, it was great. Like, it was great memories. There's nothing wrong. But every time that we get together since then, we've always said that it's not been our best family vacation. Because the purpose of family vacation isn't just pleasure and pain avoidance. It is to connect relationally and to be together. We missed the point. The point isn't just pleasure or pain avoidance. The, uh, the goal was to be together relationally. We're a family. We love each other. And often we think life is about pleasure and pain avoidance when God says you are made to be a part of something bigger than yourself. You are made to bring up there, down here. You have transcendent purpose. You are meant to be a son or daughter of the Most High who reflects his goodness to a dark and broken world. But every day we're going to have to pick. Am I going to choose the temporary self-preservation or am I going to choose a transcendent purpose? And then the last thing, perfection wins over imperfection. The reality is, is that we all face imperfect authority. I'm deeply flawed. I always tell people, if you're perfect, you should run. We will mess you up. <laughs> There's no such thing as a perfect spouse, perfect children, perfect politician, perfect pastor. There's no such thing as perfect people. We have an imperfect system. And so the hard part is, is how do we trust that a perfect God wins over imperfection? Well, that's really easy. The tomb of Jesus is empty. And that's what Jesus trusted. There was an imperfect authority who created imperfection in his life, but he knew that there was a perfect God, that his eternity and his life would not be defined by that. It would be defined by who his father was. And I was trying to think of an example of like, where does perfection win over imperfection? I was, I was trying to think about this. I was, I was thinking about marriages that have gone the distance. Have you, have you ever run into somebody that's been married like for 50 or 60 years? Old people, you get them and they're all like old and they're wrinkly and that's, I'm going to be there someday, so I'm not making fun of them. That's what I'm going to look like, right? And you ever ask them like, how did you do it? And they go, we just chose to stick together. Like, I'm like well, I'd like a little bit better advice than that, please. I'd like to... Enjoy it at some, right? right? And so, but there is a beauty when two imperfect people believe in a perfect God and believe in a perfect picture at the end that despite their imperfections, that they, out of the will, not out of their feelings, choose to love each other and serve each other all the days of their life. And Jesus trusted that in the imperfection that there was a perfect God who works all things out. And some people say, well, Matt, people die of disease. People die early. And here's just want to say, if you get your healing, you're still going to die. Death is 100% sure for every single human being. The real question is, did we live? Did we live the kind of life that conquers hell and death? Does that, does that reside on the inside? Are we trusting the imperfect or the perfect? If I was going to sum up the whole talk today, I'd say this. Choosing ourselves as imperfect authority out of self-preservation leads to the very dysfunction we're trying to avoid. Every single thing that we regret, every single decision that we regret, we made. And when we made it, we thought it was a good decision. And we were wrong. Choosing ourselves to be our own authority, to submit to our version of a good life, literally leads to the very dysfunction that we don't like. So what's the solution? It's so simple. 
we're going to put it up on the screen. Submission. God, I choose your version of a good life, and not mine. And not somebody else's, not what's on Instagram, not what's on Facebook, not what's on TikTok. Not what someone else thinks, God, what you think. I'm going to submit to your version, uh, to God, leads to the... Now here's what I want to say. The best life isn't always the easiest. Somebody should say amen. amen. That we can have both now and eternity. And I just, like, I want to say something that's true of me, and it might not be true of you, but I, I just need to say it in all honesty, okay? Is, am I allowed to be honest with you? I'm going to be honest whether you say yes or no anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> Many of us want the results of the life of Jesus without having to live like Jesus. We all want the blessings in the life that raised Jesus from the dead. We just don't want to actually live like Jesus, and you don't get both. You have to pick one to get the other. And I know this is true in my life. I was trying to think about how to close this whole series, free to be me, in a world full of lines. A couple weeks ago, there was somebody who attended South Point. They passed away, and they're fairly young. And then I went home, and I told my wife, just, I was heartbroken. It was, it was sad. This person knows Jesus. And it got me thinking. I was thinking, you know, someday that, that's going to be my day. And what do I want him to say? What do I want my life, what do, you want your, what do you want your life to be given to? Man, they made the most money. They were so handsome and beautiful that everyone wanted to be with them physically. They got to avoid all the pain. Like, what do you want people to say at that day? And it got me thinking about my life. And as I began to look back on my life, there have been some really difficult seasons because you think maybe pastors, pastors don't get a pass, we just get more pressure. And I began to think about the times when my wife and I miscarried. I began to think about the years that I was physically sick and had to go to the doctors. I think about the years where we were physically pedaling uphill as one of my daughters struggled with some physical ailments. And I can tell you there were times where I wanted to go, I need some pleasure in my life, and I want some pain avoidance. And as I look back at my life, I am so glad that I chose submission to what God's version of a good life was and not my version of a good life. Because all the dumb decisions that I knew would feel good in the moment would actually rob me of the very life that I want. And it was stupid hard. Following Jesus is the most, is literally the stupid hardest thing that you will ever do in your life. It is literally the best thing that you can ever do in your life. Because when you submit to his mission, then you become the son or the daughter of the most high. The goodness of God begins to live in your heart and you bring up there down here and you get to give your life to something that is greater than just you and that kind of life isn't killed by physical death or spiritual death and there's a day where all will be made right and so i just have a challenge what version of a good life have you submitted your life to and i just want to ask a question today are you here and you know a lot about Jesus? Are you here today and you have a lot of feelings about Jesus, some good feelings during worship? Do you like go out and do good deeds? And I just want to ask the question, I, not that any of those are wrong or bad, but I just want to ask, have you submitted to Jesus? Have you surrendered? Because followers and surrender to Jesus is so simple. We just admit that we get it wrong. We believe who he is, he says he is, and that he died on our cross and he conquered hell and death on our behalf. And it's not about perfection. It is committing to a direction of putting him first in every area of our life. And then you begin to experience eternal life, the kind of life worth living forever. And that's how we're free to be me. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you that when we got it wrong, God, 
that when we messed it up, then when we were all picked our own way, when we thought it was right and we got it dead wrong, when we knew it was wrong and we chose it anyway, God, thank you that you sent your son who died on a cross and gives us the consequences of his proper choices, his obedience, and he took our consequences of missing the mark. But God, you didn't just do that to get us to a place called heaven. God, you did that to get heaven in us and to give us a transcendent purpose greater than our self-preservation, God. God, help us to trust your character, to pick transcendent purpose, God, and to know that even in an imperfect world, your perfect will is being worked out, God. God, our trust is not in ourselves, but in you, God. You came that we might have life. Our hope and our trust is in you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, Amen. 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 Church, would you stand with us? We're going to sing a new song today called Give Me Your Peace.
something and it just hits my heart so yes. much following jesus is the stupid hardest thing you'll ever do <laughs> right following jesus is the best thing you'll ever do and Amen. it's all about choice because you choose to do it but when you choose it is a hard thing to choose it, it is yeah wow it's up anyway thanks to all of you who continue to partner with us at south point through your giving it truly is an act of worship that reminds us that everything that we have belongs to him anyway that's right so thank you very much we want to just let you know that when you give to South Point financially, it does impact our community locally, nationally, and globally. If you want to give, you want to set up your giving, it's super easy. There's a link popping up in the chat, or you can go to our website, southpointforyou.com slash give and set up your giving. Super easy. That's right. And if this is your first time worshiping with us, we want you to know that this service is a gift to you. So please feel no pressure to give. Uh, and we have a couple of announcements for you that you don't want to miss. Uh, I think Elisa mentioned it early in the announcement, so it's not a surprise, but we are going to have a night of worship on October 21st. That's a Friday from 7 to 8.30. There's going to be light refreshments and child care for children, fifth grade and under. You don't want to miss it. We're going to be streaming it online, so if you're not in the area, you can join us there. If there's any way you can make it into the uh, building in person, we would love to see you. And it's going to be a great night. It really is. There is nothing like it. And guess what else? South Point is hiring. You want to yeah. join the cool kids on the block? No, seriously, <laughs> a fantastic group of people to work for. They are looking for an operations administrator. It's yeah. a part-time job, 20, 25 hours a week. Sunday afternoons are a must because all the big things happen on Sundays. So yeah. We need some help on Sunday afternoons. If you're very organized and detail-oriented, you can find out more at southpointforyou.com slash jobs. And by the way, we're asking you, if you're interested, you need to do it quickly. Apply by tomorrow, October 10th at midnight. Awesome. All right, friends, I think that's all we have for, to, for you today. Uh, if you need us, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can reach us via social media or by calling or texting us at 240-925-8787. And remember, you matter deeply to God. Have a great Sunday. Bye, friends.